As you approach midnight, infinitely many Grim Reapers await you. Each Reaper kills you at its designated time if none of the earlier Reapers kill you by that time. But if some earlier Reaper does kill you, then any later Reaper remains inactive. Reaper number one is set to 60 seconds past midnight. Reaper number two, 30 seconds past midnight. Reaper number three, 15 seconds. Reaper number four, seven and a half seconds. And so on ad infinitum, with the Reapers set to ever smaller times past midnight. The question is, will you survive? Given the details of the opening story, we know that some Reaper must kill you, since if you survive until 60 seconds past midnight, Reaper number one will kill you. But paradoxically, none of the Reapers actually kill you. Suppose some Reaper kills you. Well, then you survived past infinitely many previous Reapers. But that can't be, since each of those previous Reapers would have killed you if you survived up until their designated time. So it can't be the case that some Reaper kills you. This is the heart of the Grim Reaper paradox. We know that some Reaper must kill you, but none of them could have killed you. This paradox has been used to motivate various metaphysical hypotheses, ranging from the hypothesis that time can't be infinitely divisible, to the hypothesis that there can't be actual infinites, to the hypothesis that there can't be infinite causal chains, to the hypothesis that there can't be infinite pasts, since you can actually construct a Grim Reaper paradox with infinitely many Reapers spread out over the infinite past, rather than scrunched up into a finite period of time, as in the paradox that I just presented. And these hypotheses, of course, are clearly relevant to the Kalam cosmological argument, which says that whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, so the universe has a cause. Now, in other videos of mine that you can find in my Kalam playlist, I've criticized in tremendous depth arguments that use the Grim Reaper paradox to motivate these metaphysical hypotheses, and by extension to motivate the Kalam. You can check out videos number 9 and 12 through 24 of this playlist. I've also published several articles criticizing these arguments, and have several others under review and under construction, with even further criticisms. You can find links to the publicly available stuff here in the description. But today we're going to be focusing on just one of my recent articles published in the journal Mind, entitled The End is Near, Grim Reapers and Endless Futures. In particular, I'm just going to read through and provide a little commentary to try to make it at least more accessible to you guys. I may not succeed in making it accessible, but hey, I'll try. Oh, and w w what's he doing there? He's telling you to subscribe to Majesty of Reason. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, and now he's holding a Patreon badge. This is embarrassing, dude. You're making me look like a grifter. Please stop. Look, he's mad at you for not supporting creators that you enjoy on Patreon. Okay, let's get to the paper. So yes, here is the paper. And oh yes, my name is Joseph. Yes, indeed. But yes, I already introduced the sort of Grim Reaper paradox, which has been recently employed in favor of various finitist metaphysical theses. And finitism basically is just ruling out certain kinds of infinity from the realm of possibility. So saying that, hey, maybe actual infinites are impossible. That's a kind of strict finitism. Maybe you're saying that nothing can have infinitely many causes. That's a version of finitism called causal finitism, and so on. So finitist metaphysical theses are just theses that rule out certain kinds of infinities from the realm of possibility, more specifically metaphysical possibility, which is like what really could have been the case in reality. You can think of metaphysical possibility in terms of worlds, which are basically just complete or comprehensive or total or maximal ways that reality could be. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. The Grim Reaper Paradox, as I said in the intro, has been employed in favor of various metaphysical theses. And here I examine a new challenge to these finitist arguments, which is the challenge of implying that the future cannot be endless. In particular, I develop future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes or future-oriented Grim Reaper paradoxes and examine their symmetry with past-oriented paradoxes. And of course, that's why the title is The End is Near, right? People who are mounting the Grim Reaper paradox in favor of these metaphysical theses are probably going to have to think that the future is going to have to come to an end. And so the end is near. Hey, I thought it was a fun title. Just let me have my moment of joy. So let's get into the introduction. Suppose there's an infinite sequence of Grim Reapers bent on killing Fred. Each Reaper is assigned a unique natural number and a designated time to kill him. If no earlier Reaper killed Fred at Reaper N's designated time, well then Reaper N kills Fred at that time. But if an earlier Reaper killed Fred, Reaper N does nothing. Reaper 1's designated time is 60 seconds past noon, Reaper 2's designated time is 30 seconds past noon, and so on ad infinitum. 
Now, as I say here, clearly some Reaper must have killed Fred, right? If no Reaper killed Fred up to 1201, well, then Reaper 1 would kill him. But reflection reveals that no Reaper could have killed him, right? If some arbitrary Reaper, number N, killed Fred, well, then no earlier Reaper killed Fred. Well, then all the more so it follows that no Reaper killed Fred before Reaper N plus 1's deadline. And in that case, Reaper N plus 1 killed Fred. Right, but then, after all, Reaper N didn't kill Fred, right? Since a Reaper kills Fred only if no earlier Reaper kills him. So what follows from this sort of reasoning is that there is no number N such that Reaper N killed Fred. In other words, no Reaper killed Fred. And yet we just saw earlier that some Reaper killed Fred. Okay, so that's the contradiction. It's basically the contradiction that I walked you through at the beginning of the video. In slightly less formal terms, you get the picture. That is the Grim Reaper paradox. Now, versions of this paradox date back at least to Jose Benedetti's 1964 book, An Essay in Metaphysics, and their manifold incarnations involve deafening gongs, firing squads, gods erecting impassable walls, and even sentences whose truth is conditioned on the truth of infinitely many other sentences. So there are lots of different variants of this Grim Reaper paradox. And I call these different variants, or these different paradoxical incarnations, Benedetti paradoxes, named after, of course, Jose Benedetti. And these Benedetti paradoxes have been employed in support of many metaphysical conclusions, ranging from thinking that time must be necessarily discrete, basically think of that as time can't be infinitely divisible, there must be some smallest unit of time. Others try to use Benedetti paradoxes to think that the past must be finite. Still others try to use the paradox to motivate the claim that infinite causal regresses are impossible, etc. As I say here, these metaphysical conclusions are typically finitist in nature. That is, they typically exclude certain infinities from the realm of metaphysical possibility. My goal in this article is to level a new challenge to arguments for finitist metaphysical theses based on Benedetti paradoxes. And I basically call those sorts of arguments B arguments, okay? So what is a B argument? A B argument is an argument for one of these finitist metaphysical theses that is based on a Benedetti paradox. So for instance, an example of a B argument is an argument from the Grim Reaper paradox in favor of causal finitism, say, the view that nothing can have infinitely many causes. That's an example of a B argument. So I'm basically leveling a new challenge to these sorts of arguments, these B arguments. And the challenge targets a conditional premise in those arguments that links the possibility of various infinites to the possibility of Benedetti paradoxes. I begin in section two by articulating the structure of Benedetti paradoxes and explaining how they're employed in favor of the aforementioned finitist theses. Then in section three, I develop the challenge in the form of a dilemma. Basically, proponents of B arguments must either embrace the impossibility of an endless future or else justify B argument linking premises in ways that don't equally justify a new linking premise that implies the impossibility of an endless future. And I argue that if theism is true specifically, then the justifications that exist for B argument linking premises equally justify this new linking premise. And again, I'm going to get to what that new linking premise is, right? This is, this is all just set up, okay? So it may not make much sense now, but I will explain it in due course. So yes, I argue that at least under theism, justifications for B argument linking premises equally justify this new, and so at least theists and people who are using B arguments ultimately on behalf of theism, such as in the context of the Kalam, are going to also have to be committed to the impossibility of an endless future. That's kind of the ultimate conclusion. And I also consider extensions of my reasoning that discharge theistic assumptions. So let's move on to section two, Benedetti paradoxes, unsatisfiable pairs, and finitism. So Benedetti paradoxes share an abstract structure. They all have the same kind of form. And that's why there are so many different like incarnations of them or so many different versions or variants. You can basically fill in the concrete details in so many different ways because they all just share this abstract structure. And that structure involves a pair of jointly logically unsatisfiable conditions. That basically just means that there's two claims within this abstract structure which are logically inconsistent. Like just by the form of the sentences alone, you can deduce a strict contradiction of the form P and not P from those sentences. All the paradoxes share this structure where they embed these two sentences which are logically inconsistent with one another. They jointly entail a contradiction. This has been shown by Nicholas Shackle in a 2005 paper entitled The Form of Benedetti's Dichotomy or something like that. It's in, it's in the references, okay? So here I'm going to explain this abstract structure. I'm going to explain this unsatisfiable pair, this pair of conditions which is jointly unsatisfiable. Nothing could possibly satisfy it because it jointly entails a contradiction. They're inconsistent with one another. So let an unbegun set be an infinite set, so it's just a collection of items with infinitely many members, and which is linearly ordered by this relation, this before relation, and where this set has no first member. That is, there's no member M of the set which is such that there's nothing before it. So in other words, every member of the set has another member before it. So an ordering relation is basically just a relation between elements within a collection 
that can be used to order the members of the collection in relation to one another. It really just like ranks the elements of the set against one another. So like you could have a first member, a second member, a third member, and so on. So you're just kind of like ordering the members in a particular way. And the ordering relation can be various different relations like causes that will order the members of a set. Like A will cause B, B might cause C, and so on. Like you can put them in a particular order and rank them against one another in terms of like how they relate to one another uh, by means of this relation. That's a rough sketch of what an ordering relation is. And so an unbegun set is just an infinite set, so a set with infinitely many members, which is ordered by this before relation, and where that relation basically just stretches in one particular direction linearly and has no first member in that direction. Okay, so that, that's really what this means. So an example of an unbegun set would be the set of past times in an infinite past universe, right? So there's this ordering relation, this earlier than relation, there's no first member of this set, right? Every member of the set is such that there's a previous member of the set, and there are infinitely many items within it. So that's basically what an unbegun set is. Just think of it as an infinite set whose members can be ordered in a kind of linear way, such that in at least one direction, the ordering is kind of beginningless. Now note that before here is not a temporal relation, at least not necessarily. Rather, it's an abstractly characterized ordering relation. It's just an abstract relation on a set. It just pairs elements of that set with one another in a particular order. So, now that I've talked about what an unbegun set is, the first condition in the unsatisfiable pair, which is the unbegun condition, or UC, can be stated as follows, where X and Y are members of a non-empty set S, which is linearly ordered by the before relation. So here's the unbegun condition. It's basically saying that for every member of the set, there is some member before it, right? So for any X, there is a Y such that Y is before X. The second condition in the unsatisfiable pair, which is the at if and only if nowhere before condition, or ANBC, I'm getting these terms from Shackle, by the way, states that for each member X of a non-empty set S, linearly ordered by the before relation, X satisfies some predicate E, if and only if no member before X satisfies E. So think back to the Grim Reaper story that I told, right? Remember, I, I basically said that each Reaper is going to kill you, if and only if none of the earlier ones kill you, right? They're going to kill you at their designated time, if, but only if, none of the earlier Reapers kill you, right? That's this at, if, and only if, nowhere before condition, right? It's stating that for each member of the relevant linearly ordered set, that member satisfies some predicate. So in other words, something is true of that member, if and only if that thing isn't true of any of the earlier members. So again, for each Reaper, the following is the case. That Reaper is going to kill you, if and only if none of the earlier ones kill you, right? So each Reaper has some property or does some action or satisfies some predicate, if and only if none of the earlier ones do. That is this at, if and only if, nowhere before condition. It's saying that each member of that set satisfies some predicate E, so something is true of that member if and only if E isn't true of any of the earlier members. And here's the little formal rendition of that. It's saying that for any X, X satisfies E if and only if there isn't a Y before X which satisfies E. So for any Reaper X, Reaper X kills you if and only if there does not exist a Reaper Y such that Reaper Y kills you and Reaper Y is before Reaper X. That's basically what it's saying. So you can kind of see how this maps on to the Grim Reaper paradox that I was giving earlier on. Now, Nicholas Shackle and others have shown that these two conditions are simply inconsistent. And notice that this is just like an abstract predicate here. This is just an abstract ordering relation. Like, all of this is just purely abstract. We aren't even talking about, like, causation and time and so on. These two conditions alone are just logically inconsistent with one another. I'm not going to go through and derive that formal contradiction. You can read it here if you are curious, but we are going to move on. So, we might wonder why any substantive metaphysical conclusion is called for in response to Bernardetti paradoxes. After all, we shouldn't blame one of the conjuncts of an unsatisfiable pair simply because the pair together is unsatisfiable. Or like, here's an unsatisfiable pair, Joe exists and Joe doesn't exist. Okay, that's logically unsatisfiable. That couldn't be the case. It jointly entails a contradiction. But we can't conclude that either of those conjuncts within that inconsistent conjunction is impossible, simply from the fact that the conjunction is impossible, right? Even though it's individually possible that I exist, and even though it's individually possible that I don't exist, it's not possible that both of those are the case, right? It's not possible that I both exist and don't exist. So merely from the fact that a conjunction is impossible or unsatisfiable, it doesn't follow that any particular conjunct is unsatisfiable or impossible. In fact, every single conjunct might itself individually be possible and individually be satisfiable, even though their entire conjunction isn't. I actually cover this hugely important point in assessing arguments from paradoxes in my Common Mistakes series. It's in the video on the Kalaman contingency arguments. I highly recommend checking it out for those interested. 
But anyway, as I say here, we might wonder why any substantive metaphysical conclusion is called for in response to Benedetti paradoxes. But at this juncture, those who employ Benedetti paradoxes in support of finitist metaphysical theses offer the following B argument schema, where the notion of possibility at play is metaphysical possibility. So here's just a schematic rendering of B arguments. This is how proponents of these B arguments are saying, no, we actually do need to embrace some sort of metaphysical conclusion in order to solve Benedetti paradoxes. They're using this structure of argument in order to try to establish that. So here's just the general structure of their arguments. And as I go on to explain, there are various particular instances of this kind of argument where people are trying to use Benedetti paradoxes to infer various particular finitist metaphysical theses. So yeah, here's the schematic structure of B arguments. Premise one, if there could be beginningless or unbegun sets ordered by a before relation, well then there could be these beginningless unbegun sets that also satisfy a NBC. That is the crucial linking premise. But there cannot be unbegun sets that satisfy a NBC, right? That's just the contradiction from earlier. So it follows that there cannot be unbegun sets ordered by relation R. Right, so this is pretty abstract. Let's get some concrete cases. Basically, if you fill in R, this relation, with causes, Alexander Proust offers an argument in favor of causal finitism that implicitly fits this schema, right? His basic argument is that if there could be infinite causal chains, right, so that's just an unbegun set ordered by the relation causes, well then, according to Proust, there could be infinite causal chains which also satisfy A and B, C. In other words, there could be these Grim Reaper paradoxes. But, of course, there can't be Grim Reaper paradoxes, and so Proust concludes that there can't be infinite causal chains. So notice that that sort of argument fits this schema. It's basically saying, if there could be infinite causal chains, well, then there could be these sorts of Benedetti paradoxes involving those infinite causal chains. But, of course, there can't be these sorts of Benedetti paradoxes, and hence it follows that there can't be infinite causal chains. Of course, I don't think that argument succeeds. I'm just outlining the argument itself. But that's just one concrete instance of this B argument schema. Here's another concrete instance. Temporal finitists, so those who think that past time must be finite, have also employed Benedetti paradoxes in support of their view. The abstract form of the temporal finitist argument runs as follows. So basically, if there could be an unbegun set of equal intervals of past time ordered by the earlier than relation, well, then there could be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C. But there can't be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C. Again, that's what we learned from the unsatisfiable pair. And so there cannot be an unbegun set of equal intervals of past time ordered by the earlier than relation. So in simpler terms, this is basically just saying, if there could be an infinite past, well, then there could be these sorts of Benedetti paradoxes. But there can't be these sorts of Benedetti paradoxes. So there can't be an infinite past. That's basically what this is saying. Here, I'm just regimenting in very strict, formal, clear, analytical terms what it is for the past to be infinite, and connecting that to the abstract structure of B arguments mentioned above. Other B arguments, of course, roughly follow suit. They roughly fit this sort of schema. So with all this background in hand, we can now turn to the new challenge for B arguments, which is this grim dilemma. Y you get it, grim dilemma, grim reaper? <gasps> so to explain the challenge, I will articulate a future oriented Benedetti paradox. So instead of these past oriented ones, this is saying basically if there could be an infinite past, well then there could be infinitely many reapers spread out over that past, such that each reaper does something if and only if none of the previous reapers do. And that of course gives us a Benedetti paradox. Basically what I'm doing for the future oriented paradox is basically just giving the exact same argument, but just reversing the times so that it's future oriented, right? Basically saying if there could be an endless future, well then there could be infinitely many reapers spread out over that endless future, such that each reaper does something if and only if none of the future reapers do something. And you get the exact same contradiction. And so if we can infer from that that the past can't be beginningless, well, then we can also infer from that that the future cannot be endless. That is the basic challenge, okay? <laughs> That's, if you take anything away from this video, just take away what I just said. So to explain the challenge, again, I will articulate a future-oriented Benedetti paradox and construct an argument symmetric to standard B arguments, whose conclusion is that the future cannot be endless. The challenge itself is basically just a dilemma. Either embrace the impossibility of an endless future, or else try to justify B argument linking premises in ways that don't equally support the symmetric arguments linking premise. Okay, so again, what is a B argument linking premise? Well, again, it's like the first premise in these sorts of B arguments for finitist conclusions. It's the premise that links the possibility of a certain kind of infinity on the one hand with the possibility of a Benedetti paradox. They're basically saying, hey, if there could be a certain kind of infinity, then there could be a Benedetti paradox. And of course, since there can't be Benedetti paradoxes, it follows that there can't be that kind of infinity. There can't be infinite causal chains, there can't be infinite pasts. And in the case of my symmetric argument, there can't be endless futures. The original temporal finitist argument is basically saying if there could be a beginningless past, well, then you could have Benedetti paradoxes, but you can't, so there can't be a beginningless past. The symmetric argument is saying, hey, if there could be an endless future, then there could be Benedetti paradoxes, but of course there can't, and so there can't be an endless future. 
That is the symmetric argument. And the symmetric linking premise is basically the future-oriented version of this premise here. It's basically saying if there could be an endless future, well, then there could be a Benedetti paradox. So yes, again, the challenge is a dilemma. Basically, they either have to embrace the impossibility of an endless future, or they need to justify their linking premise in a way that doesn't just equally transfer to my linking premise, right? <laughs> right? Because if they do just justify their linking premise in a way that equally transfers to my linking premise, well, then if they're going to accept their linking premise on that basis, they're going to have to accept my linking premise on the same basis. And of course, my linking premise, together with this uncontroversial second premise, leads to the impossibility of an endless future, right? So if they don't justify their linking premise in ways that equally support my linking premise, well, then they're going to have to embrace the impossibility of an endless future. So, so they really just have two options. Either embrace the impossibility of an endless future or else roll up their sleeves and try to justify their linking premises in ways that don't equally justify mine. So that is the grim dilemma. That is the challenge. That's a new challenge. That's a central challenge of my paper. And I will argue that if theism is true, at least, the justifications that exist, right, so the extant justifications for B-argument linking premises equally support the symmetric argument's linking premise. That's my linking premise, the symmetric argument in the endless future version. I say here that the significance of this conclusion will be discussed in due course, as will extensions of my reasoning that discharge theistic assumptions, right? So we can even discharge this if theism is true here. So here is the future-oriented paradox. Suppose there's an endless series of grim reapers, each of which has a scythe, a unique natural number, and a designated future day to swing its scythe. Through acts of divine revelation, God lets each reaper know whether a future reaper will swing its scythe. If God informs reaper N that no reaper in the future of reaper N's designated day will swing its scythe, well then reaper N swings its scythe. But if God informs reaper N that some reaper in the future of reaper N's designated day will swing its scythe, well then reaper N does nothing. Reaper 1's designated day is today plus one day. Reaper 2's designated day is today plus two days. More generally, for each natural number n, Reaper n's designated day is today plus n days. Now, it should be evident that this scenario instantiates the unsatisfiable pair, right? Each Reaper is such that there is a Reaper in its future, giving us UC. So we have a certain direction along an ordering relation in which that direction doesn't have a quote-unquote first member. Of course, here it's a last member, but it's the same abstract structure. And that, of course, gives us UC. And moreover, each reaper swings its scythe if and only if no reaper in its future swings its scythe, and that gives us a n b c. This scenario is therefore structurally identical to past-oriented Benedetti paradoxes employed in the context of standard B arguments for finitist theses. The only differences, of course, are the reversed temporal ordering and the addition of God. Given their structural identity and reversed temporal ordering, we can construct a symmetric argument for the impossibility of an endless future. This is basically just saying, if there could be an unbegun set of equal intervals of future time, ordered by the later than relation, well then there could be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C. But of course there can't be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C, as we learn from the unsatisfiable pair, and so there can't be an unbegun set of equal intervals of future time ordered by the later than relation. In other words, there can't be an endless future. So yes, in simpler terms, this is saying, if there could be an endless future, then there could be a Benedetti paradox, there can't be a Benedetti paradox, so there can't be an endless future. And this is where the challenge for proponents of B arguments arises. They cannot deny eight on pain of denying a premise in their own B arguments, right? <laughs> and so they therefore face a dilemma. Either embrace nine, which is the impossibility of an endless future, or else explain why their justification for their B argument linking premises does not carry over to my linking premise, which is seven here. As I say here, if such justification does carry over, that is, if it equally justifies my linking premise, well then if one accepts B argument linking premises on its basis, one should also accept my linking premise on the same basis. Now, embracing the impossibility of an endless future may be quite costly. Here's why this is, I think, a grim dilemma, right? I'm basically going to argue that proponents of B arguments, the justification for their linking premises actually does carry over to premise 7 here. <laughs> That's what I'm going to argue. So basically, they really do just have to uh, commit to the impossibility of an endless future. And I, I think that's quite costly, at least in my view, right? Because if nine is true, if that conclusion is true, the future can't be endless. But to many, it just seems obvious that the future could be endless. They just have this kind of modal seeming. Doesn't seem to be anything absurd or wrong about it. Seems obvious to many that there could just be like some kind of strange particle that just continually emits some sort of radiation, like it pulsates just throughout the rest of endless eternity. And other modal epistemological tools can be adduced here too, such as conceivability, right? It seems perfectly conceivable. It seems coherently imaginable that there could be an endless future. So there are other modal epistemological tools here too, in addition to just the straight up seeming overwhelming plausibility, at least to many of us, that the future could be endless. 
But for the sake of modesty in my paper, I won't actually rely on the falsity of nine. That is, I'm not actually going to rely on the claim that the future could be endless. I'm just going to raise my challenge in the form of dilemma, right? <laughs> like, if you guys want to accept that horn of the dilemma on which the future cannot be endless, that's okay. Be my guest. Note that the remainder of my discussion, then, will focus on the second horn of the dilemma, which is basically just whether the justifications for original B-argument linking premises equally carry over to my linking premise, which is the future-oriented one. Failing to meet the second horn and consequently being impaled by the first is significant in itself. So before we turn to the justifications for B-argument linking premises, it's worth noting that such justifications may not equally support my linking premise simply because the future-oriented paradox, whose possibility is asserted in my linking premise's consequent, so the part after the then, involves God, right? After all, motivations for B-argument linking premises certainly don't motivate the possibility of God's existence conditional on some anti-finitist assumption. But given the way that I've constructed the future-oriented paradox, and given that the possibility of this paradox is asserted in the consequent of my linking premise, motivating my linking premise does require motivating the possibility of God's existence conditional on the possibility of an endless future. So that's a worry that one might have. Like, well, hold on a second, Joe. The motivations surely don't transfer over from the past-oriented linking premise to the future-oriented linking premise, because the future-oriented linking premise requires, like, God in the story, right? <laughs> it requires God to, like, reveal to these reapers. But justifying the past-oriented linking premise doesn't require justifying God's existence. So that's a worry that one might have for my claim that the justifications carry over, carry over from the past-oriented linking premise to my future-oriented linking premise. So to circumvent that worry, I'm going to argue only for the conditional claim that if theism is true, right, so like, if you grant me God's existence, then the motivations for the past-oriented B argument linking premises do indeed carry over to my future-oriented linking premise. To put it differently, while motivations for B argument linking premises may not by themselves carry over to premise 7, they do carry over when conjoined with theism. And this contention is significant for at least two reasons. First, many of these B arguments are wielded on behalf of premises in first cause arguments for theism, right? A number of authors employ B arguments on behalf of the Kalam cosmological argument, as we've seen. It's significant then that conditional on God's existence, motivations for the B argument linking premises equally motivate my linking premise. This, in turn, commits those who deploy B arguments on behalf of theistic arguments to the impossibility of an endless future. Moreover, if B argument proponents wish to avoid this commitment, then they should reject theism, a significant result in itself. I then talk here about how, well, what, what if we affirm open theism? Can, can that help us get, can that help us avoid it? And I basically say, I really don't think it does, because we can construct the paradox in such a way that it doesn't rely on God's foreknowledge of presently undetermined events. Or like open theists grant that God knows his single present already formed infallible intentions, and that's all we need to run the Benedetti paradox, right? Just suppose that each reaper is a deterministic automaton whose actions or inactions are ordained by one of God's present infallible intentions. And in that case, there's going to be no indeterminacy, etc., and open theism won't help. Okay. Or at least so I contend in the paper. You can read that for more. So that is the first reason why I think this contention is twofold. My contention that if theism is true, well then motivations for past-oriented B-argument linking premises are going to equally carry over to my linking premise. The second reason why I think it's significant is that the assumption of theism is actually dischargeable, right? So I, I, I don't technically need to assume theism so long as other assumptions are conditioned upon. Right? Like After all, future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes can be constructed without God. For instance, suppose that each reaper in the future-oriented Benedetti paradox is causally sensitive not to acts of divine revelation, but rather to the states of any subsequent reaper. Suppose further that each reaper enjoys the power and disposition to swing its scythe if and only if no future reaper swings its scythe. Alternatively, suppose that it's simply a brute fact about the reapers, that each will swing its scythe if and only if no future reaper swings its scythe, where this biconditional is purely truth functional and devoid of any causal sensitivity to the uh, actions or inactions of future reapers. In both of these sorts of cases, UC and ANBC are satisfied. The unsatisfiable pair is satisfied in these sorts of cases, so we get a paradox. But no theistic assumptions are operative. Instead, the relevant auxiliary assumptions that we're conditioning upon include one, the metaphysical possibility of mechanisms that are causally sensitive to certain future states, and two, the metaphysical possibility of mechanisms whose states are brutally correlated with certain future states. By brutally correlated, I mean are correlated without an explanation, or at least minimally without a causal explanation with certain future states. So yeah, that's how you would run this sort of future-oriented challenge without conditioning upon theism, without making any theistic assumptions. 
And you, you don't need both of these assumptions, of course, right? Like, again, I just gave two examples. You, you could use one or the other. You only need one of them. But I, I just wanted to give kind of two options for how it might go. Um, but, of course, because these assumptions are controversial and rejected by some of the main proponents of B arguments, I focus in my paper primarily on establishing the parity or symmetry between B argument linking premises and my future-oriented linking premise conditional on theism, okay? So that's really what I focus on for the rest of my paper. I will only briefly discuss conditioning on non-theistic assumptions. So I've explained the nature and significance of my contention, and let's now turn to establishing that contention. So again, what is that contention? Well, that contention is basically that at least conditional on theism, the motivations for the past-oriented linking premise in the original B arguments equally motivate or equally justify my linking premise in my future-oriented Benedetti paradox. And so at least conditional upon theism, people who run the original past-oriented B argument are going to have to also think that my future-oriented B argument succeeds, and hence they're going to have to be committed to the impossibility of an endless future. And as I explained above, that's not a very welcome commitment, <laughs> especially for Christians and lots of other religious people. Traditionally speaking, the afterlife is understood in temporally endless terms. Like, Christians definitely don't want to be committing to the impossibility of an endless future, because we're supposed to have an endless, everlasting life with God. Or, of course, away from God, being tortured for all eternity, if you have some monumentally implausible views. Traditionally, that is indeed understood in temporal terms. After all, traditionally speaking, there is going to be a resurrection of the body for us. We're going to indeed have bodies in this afterlife. And at least human bodies don't seem to be the kinds of things that could be timeless. So it seems like an endless afterlife would indeed have to be temporally endless. And also, it doesn't seem to make much sense for us to go from a state of temporality to a state of timelessness. It doesn't seem to make much sense because then the state of timelessness would seem to be after our state of temporality. But of course, timeless states cannot stand in any temporal relations. And if you don't say that it's after our current state, well, then it's like already existing. Like the timeless state is kind of already there. And we're all like already either in heaven or hell. Like what? <laughs> So anyway, I think there are lots of problems for thinking that the afterlife for at least us humans is going to be timelessly endless rather than temporally endless. So I think it's quite plausible then that Christians specifically are going to have to be very worried about some of their arguments for God's existence implying the impossibility of an endless future. It's basically then just going to falsify their Christianity. But okay, that is my contention. At least under theism, the motivations for B-argument linking premises equally motivate my future-oriented linking premise. That is my central contention. And so let's get into the extant support for B-argument linking premises. So, proponents of B-arguments have offered two principal lines of support for the linking premises. The first line, developed in Kuhn's and also appealed to in Proust's book Infinity, Causation, and Paradox, appeals to patchwork or recombination principles. I'm going to explain what those are in a second. The second line of support for B-argument linking premises developed in Proust, Luna, Erasmus, etc. appeals to the alleged fact, certainly not a fact, but the alleged fact that something like a mysterious force would be required to prevent paradoxes from arising if the relevant linking premises were false. And given the implausibility of such a force, we're justified in accepting the relevant linking premises. I will consider each line of support in turn. Once more, my main contention is that each line of support equally motivates my linking premise given theism. And again, as a reminder, my linking premise basically says that if the future could be endless, then there could be a Benedetti paradox. So here is the first line of support. This line of support appeals to Patrick principles. These principles trace back at least to David Lewis, uh, but their Humean underpinnings are evident in their denial of necessary connections between distinct existences. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful. These principles basically allow you to rearrange and recombine individually possible regions and infer that the result of that recombination, or patchwork, is going to have to be a possible, like there's some possible world in which that recombination exists, right? So, so here, here's, here's a very mundane kind of case of recombination. Currently, there is a lamp to my left, and there is a water bottle to my right. Well, recombination principles basically say, well, like, hey, but given that we have one individually possible space-time region containing a lamp, and one individually possible space-time region containing a water bottle, we can basically rearrange those in space-time, in whichever way we please, and we can infer that the result there is going to be a possible world. So it's possible that instead of my lamp being on my left and my water bottle being on my right, it could have just been the other way around. You know, there's a possible world in which things are exactly the same, except this water bottle is on the left and that lamp is on the right. And you can do this for any individually possible space-time regions, provided that there's a possible world with enough kind of spatiotemporal room, as it were, to fit those individual patches. 
that's basically what the Patrick Principle says. And notwithstanding the boatloads of independent challenges to Patrick Principles that have been raised in the modal epistemological literature and the modal metaphysics literature, let's just proceed on with this Patrick Principle support. As I say here, I will simply grant the Patrick Principles used to support the relevant linking premises. That is granting something massive, and I certainly don't grant that. You can check out the other videos in my Kalam playlist for lots of different reasons to be skeptical of these Patrick Principles including for theists specifically to be skeptical of them, of course, because these Patrick principles allow us to recombine patches in which people experience excruciating suffering and just populate the world full of pure excruciating suffering with no goods accruing therefrom. So Patrick principles arguably imply that there's a possible world that God doesn't exist because God would never create such a world like that. And of course, if traditional theism is true, then God necessarily exists. And so if there's a possible world in which God doesn't exist, it just follows that theism is false. So Patrick principles arguably deliver the falsity of theism, but let's, let's not get into that. Let's just grant, let's grant Patrick principles, okay? I'm going to give proponents of B arguments all the Patrick principles you want. It's going to be raining Patrick principles in here. And I focus in particular on the Patrick principle that Kuhn's 2020 employs. The principle relies on two assumptions, Kuhn says. First, we assume that some particular localized situation S is metaphysically possible, and so contained in some possible world W1. Second, we assume that there is a second possible world, W2, with a spatiotemporal or causal structure that provides enough room for S to be repeated k times, where k is a cardinal number, either finite or infinite. On these two assumptions, the Patrick Principle licenses us to conclude that there is a third possible world, W3, in which a situation intrinsically identical to S has been repeated k times in the arrangement corresponding to the structure of W2. The picture here is that W2 provides the frame, W1 provides the sample patch, and W3 the completed quilt, right? So we basically have a, a framework world, which has enough spatiotemporal room to accommodate the relevant individual sample patches. And then we take those individual sample patches and kind of patch them together and rearrange them and combine them in whichever way we please. And that kind of forms a completed quilt. And we can infer that that completed quilt, the world in which those sample patches are arranged and combined in that kind of manner is indeed a possible world. That's why it's called a patchwork principle or a recombination principle. We're just patching things together. We're kind of patching individual possibilities together or rearranging things. They're also called rearrangement principles. Okay, so that is the Patrick principle that Kuhns employs. Now, my goal in this subsection is to show that this principle equally supports my linking premise if theism is true. To do this, I simply need to show how a quilted world, W3, instantiating my future-oriented Benedetti paradox, can result from applying Kuhn's principle to a framework world, W2, and a world, W1, containing an individual, intrinsically specified, localized sample patch. Now, if the future could be endless, then there is a possible world, W2, with, say, infinitely many future days, and so enough room to accommodate a unique reaper, together with its scythe, for each day of the endless future. Thus, to construct a quilted world, W3, instantiating a future-oriented Benedetti paradox, all we need is the localized sample patch, that is, a metaphysically possible, particular situation wherein a single reaper implements the rule to swing its scythe if and only if no future reaper swings its scythe. By my lights, it's eminently plausible, assuming that God can reveal future events to individuals, that an individual reaper following the relevant rule in light of its received revelation is possible, that is, contained in some possible world, W1. Suppose that W1 is a world in which Reaper 1 is the only Reaper ever to exist, right? We can also suppose that time both begins and ends in W1. In W1, the following localized situation S obtains. S includes God, Reaper 1 with its scythe, and God's revealing on a particular day to Reaper 1 whether some future Reaper swings its scythe. Of course, in the case at hand, God reveals that no future Reaper swings its scythe. In S, the Reaper has the power and disposition to swing its scythe if it's divinely revealed that no future Reaper swings its scythe, and to refrain from swinging its scythe if it's divinely revealed that some future Reaper swings its scythe. Of course, in the case at hand, Reaper 1 proceeds to swing its scythe. The powers in question, both God's and the Reaper's, are intrinsic to their bearers in S and W1, just as the Reaper's powers in Kuhn's Reaper paradox are intrinsic to them in their localized sample patch and world. Now, if God exists and can reveal future events to individuals, S, and so W1, seems clearly possible. There's nothing contradictory or absurd about it, right? It doesn't instantiate any better Deddy paradox, it doesn't involve infinitely many causes affecting a target state, etc. It's also perfectly conceivable and imaginable, even upon reflection and detailed specification. Furthermore, those who accept the possibility of divine foretelling tend to accept that God has in fact revealed future events to individuals, and further, that individuals have acted in light of those revelations. Moreover, it seems intolerably arbitrary and inexplicable if S were impossible, while extremely similar situations wherein individuals act in light of divine revelation of future events were entirely possible. There just doesn't seem to be any relevant difference between such possible situations in S that could account for diverging modal statuses. 
By my lights, then, S, and so W1, is clearly possible on the assumption that God can reveal future events to individuals. At the very least, this possibility, under the aforementioned assumption, isn't less plausible than the individual possibility of a single past sensitive reaper used in Kuhn's 2020b argument. We therefore have all the ingredients for justifying my linking premise using Kuhn's Patrick principle. If the future is endless, then we have a framework world, W2, with enough room to accommodate infinitely many duplications of S for each day of the endless future. And the localized situation S is indeed metaphysically possible, and so contained in some possible world, W1. Kuhn's Patrick principle implies that there is thus a third possible world, W3, in which a situation intrinsically identical to S has been repeated infinitely many times, extending into the endless future. But of course, W3 is not possible, as it contains a future-oriented Benardetti paradox. Right, we just patched together a world containing exactly the setup that I gave in my future-oriented Benardetti paradox, right? Each reaper is going to swing its scythe if and only if none of the future ones do, and they're each apprised of that information by God. Kuhn's Patrick principle thus facilitates the following argument for my linking premise, which is identical to the conclusion of this argument here. This is basically saying if there could be an endless future, then there's a possible world with enough room to accommodate infinitely many duplications of S spanning that endless future. Secondly, there is a possible world W1 containing that localized situation S that I mentioned earlier. And then here's Kuhn's Patrick principle. If there are possible worlds W1 and W2 as characterized above, here and here, then there is a possible world W3 in which a situation intrinsically identical to S has been repeated infinitely many times extending into the endless future. That just follows from Kuhn's Patrick principle. From these three, it follows that there is a possible world W3 in which a situation intrinsically identical to S has been repeated throughout the endless future infinitely many times. And of course, if there's a possible world like that, well, then there could be a Benardetti paradox, right? There could be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C. And so what we get from this argument, it delivers to us the conclusion that, that if there could be an endless future, then there could be a Benardetti paradox. In other words, there could be an unbegun set that satisfies A and B, C. And that, of course, just is my future-oriented linking premise. The payoff, then, is that the first line of support for B-argument linking premises equally motivates my linking premise given theism. So, if theism is true, then B-argument proponents should either jettison this first line of support, so basically just get rid of this first line of support, or else they need to embrace the impossibility of an endless future. I here go on to address several objections, so if you have certain objections, I invite you to check out the paper before commenting them, because I may have already addressed them. I also have a paragraph here explaining how we can discharge that theistic assumption, so check that out if you are interested. But now we're moving on to the second line of support for B-argument linking premises, which appeals to the implausible mysterious forces allegedly implied by denying those premises. If we suppose that the members of a particular unbegun set obtain, whether sequentially or all at once, ordered, say, by the relation earlier than, or causes, there doesn't seem to be anything that could prevent them from satisfying A and B, C, so the proponents of this line of support say. Logic, after all, isn't some causal force that could prevent all the members from satisfying some predicate, just in case no earlier member does. Since there's nothing that could plausibly prevent A and B, C from being satisfied for the relevant unbegun sets, if such sets were possible, it's concluded that A and B, C is possibly satisfied for the relevant unbegun sets, if such sets were possible. And that delivers the linking premise in B arguments. I've already challenged it in other videos of mine. I've already challenged it in other videos of mine. So again, check out my Klom playlist. Here, I'm just going to try to argue that at least conditional upon theism, this equally motivates my future-oriented linking premise. So one version of this mysterious force line of support is given in Luna, who, in the passage below, is responding to a Benedetti paradox described by Stephen Yablo, in which there is an unbegun set of demons, each of whom intends to say yes if all the previous demons say no and no otherwise. What stops the demons from collectively implementing their intentions? Yablo says that logic stops them, and to which Luna replies, the problem is that logic is no causal force that could intervene as an overall ontological factor to stop the demons. To see how unlike any ontological factor logic is, just ask exactly which demons are stopped by logic, for there is no logical necessity that a particular group of them be. Luna and Erasmus make essentially the same point in reference to the deafening peel Benedetti paradox. Logic is not a causal force that could step in and stop Smith from ringing the peel on certain days. Indeed, if logic could stop Smith from ringing the peel, on which days would it stop him? There is simply no logical necessity that Smith cannot ring the peel on certain days in all worlds in which time is beginningless. While the quoted passages are primarily responses to Yablo, they can clearly be employed on behalf of linking premises in B arguments. Now, as with the first line of support, I won't directly challenge the mysterious force line of support. Instead, I'll argue that the support, if successful, equally justifies my linking premise given theism. To show this, we can simply mount entirely symmetric considerations as applied to unbegun sets of, say, reapers ordered by the later-than relation. 
If the past could be beginningless, they say, surely there could be a beginningless sequence of, say, demons. And if there could be a beginningless sequence of demons, they say, surely it could be the case that they all implement the intention to say yes if all earlier demons say no and otherwise no. After all, they say, there doesn't seem to be anything that could prevent them from doing so. Logic certainly has no causal force to prevent as much. And yet there cannot be a beginningless collection of demons, all of whom implement an intention like that, right? That's, that just gives us a Benedetti paradox. Hence, they conclude, the past cannot be beginningless. But notice that we could equally argue as follows, right? If the future could be endless, surely there could be an endless sequence of demons. And if there could be an endless sequence of demons, surely it could be the case that they all implement the intention to say yes if all later demons say no, and otherwise no. After all, there doesn't seem to be anything that could prevent them from doing so. Logic certainly has no causal force to prevent as much, and nor does metaphysics, of course, right? There's no spooky metaphysical force that causally prevents Benedetti paradoxes or ungrounded causal chains from arising. And yet, of course, there cannot be such an endless collection of demons, all of whom implement their intentions. Hence, the future cannot be endless. Mutatis mutandis, cover in the bertuzzi. Mutatis mutandis, for other variants of the Benedetti paradox. That just means like the same holds with requisite modifications for other variants of the Benedetti paradox. And we can also parody with no seeming loss of plausibility the two quotations from earlier. Right? The problem is that logic and metaphysics aren't causal forces that could intervene as overall ontological factors to stop the demons and divine foretelling acts. Right? Suppose that um, God is foretelling to the demons whether or not any future demon says no. Alternatively, we can suppose that the demons can themselves see at least some portions of the future, and in particular, whether some future demon says no or yes or whatever. To see how unlike any ontological factors logic and metaphysics are, just ask exactly which future demons or divine foretelling acts are stopped by logic or metaphysics, for there is no logical or metaphysical necessity that a particular group of them be. And again, we can parody the other quotation from earlier. Neither logic nor metaphysics are causal forces that could in and stop either Smith from ringing the peel on certain future days, or stop God from foretelling stop to Smith on certain future days. Indeed, if logic or metaphysics could stop Smith from ringing the peel, or God from foretelling stuff, on which days would they stop them? There's simply no logical or metaphysical necessity that Smith cannot ring the peel on certain future days, or that God cannot foretell to Smith on certain future days in all worlds in which time is endless. Alexander Proust also levels a version of the mysterious force line of support. He argues first that if causal finitism is false, then there could be a benign or non-contradictory reversed Grim Reaper story. This story involves infinitely many reapers whose designated times, beginning at 10.30, converge from the earlier-than direction to 11 o'clock. In such a case, the set of reapers, ordered by the earlier-than relation, is no longer unbegun, right? It's no longer beginningless. It has a first member at 10.30. And as with the original past-oriented story, each reaper performs a task if and only if no earlier reaper does. In this case, the reaper at 10.30 performs the task and all the other reapers do nothing. No contradiction or absurdity here. But, continues Proust, if the reverse Grim Reaper story is possible, then it would surely be possible for there to be infinitely many tinkerers with indeterministic free will, each of whom independently adjusts the dials on a given reaper, for each reaper around 9.30. Proust then adds, surely it would be possible for them all to set the dials to the settings in the original, paradoxical, contradictory story. For each individual tinkerer could set the dial on her Grim Reaper to the setting that it would need to have in the original story. But since the tinkerers are independent and indeterministically free, what other tinkerers are doing doesn't affect what one of them can do. So there should be no difficulty about them all setting their Grim Reapers to the values needed for the original paradox. Otherwise, we have to suppose some strange metaphysical force preventing some settings. However, this too can be parodied with no seeming loss of plausibility to the endless future. If the future could be endless, then there could be a scenario in which God creates a unique reaper on each day of the endless future, where each reaper can form and implement intentions, but nevertheless refrains from doing so. In this scenario, there is no divine revelation. There are no side-swinging intentions. There aren't any reaper exercises of causal power. The reaper's intentions or powers aren't causally linked in any way. There are no ungrounded causal chains, and so on. If the future could be endless, and God exists, there should be no difficulty about such a scenario, and so such a scenario would be possible. But if this scenario is possible, then the following scenario would surely be possible too, echoing Proust's reasoning. Each of the aforementioned reapers, suppose, has an indeterministic coin, independent of any other coin, and implements the following rules. 1. Toss the coin twice. 2. If the first toss lands heads, then form and implement if its condition is met, the intention to scythe swing if God reveals that no future reaper swings its scythe. 3. If the first toss lands tails, do not form the intention in 2. 4. If the second toss lands heads, then form and implement if its condition is met, the intention to refrain from scythe swinging if God reveals that some future reaper swings its scythe. 5. If the second toss lands tails, do not form the intention in 4, 
or any other intention. Furthermore, suppose God has an indeterministic coin independent of any other coins and implements the following rules. 6. Toss the coin. 7. If the coin lands heads, then for each reaper, reveal to it whether some reaper in its future swings its scythe. 8. If the coin lands tails, then do not reveal anything to any reaper. We can now echo proofs. If this scenario were possible, then it would surely also be possible for all the reapers in God to have all their coin flips land heads. For each individual reaper could flip heads on both occasions, and God individually can flip heads. Each such result would make its associated individual reaper and God satisfy its original conditions in the future-oriented Benardetti paradox. But since the coin flips are independent and indeterministic, the results of other coin flips don't affect the results of an individual reaper's or God's coin flips. So there should be no difficulty about them all landing heads which in turn would suffice for the original future-oriented Benedetti paradox. Otherwise, we have to suppose some strange metaphysical force preventing some coins from landing heads. By my lights, this reasoning is no less plausible than Proust's mysterious force line of support for the linking premise of his B argument. If I'm right about this, then we have equally powerful reason to accept my future-oriented linking premise given theism. And as before, we can discharge any theistic assumptions if we assume that mechanisms with certain future-sensitive powers and dispositions are possible. Simply imagine infinitely many such mechanisms spread throughout the endless future, each of which is equipped with an indeterministic coin, independent of the rest, and each of which implements rules relevantly similar to 1 through 5. And in the rest of the paper, I just address an objection, so if you want to check out that, you can if you are interested. So again, I, I address lots of objections in footnotes and in throughout, throughout this entire paper, so I recommend checking the paper out if you have certain objections. So let's get into this final concluding section here. After setting up the dialectical context of B arguments, I leveled a new challenge there too. The challenge is a dilemma. Proponents of B arguments must either accept the impossibility of an endless future, or else justify B argument linking premises in ways that don't equally justify a symmetric, future-oriented linking premise. I argued that if theism is true, then extant justifications for B argument linking premises do indeed equally justify the symmetric linking premise. I also sketched ways to motivate the parity between B argument linking premises and the symmetric linking premise without any theistic assumptions. Most of all, I hope to have served in advanced debates concerning Benedetti paradoxes, finitism, and Patrick principles. And of course, those are the references. So anyway, thank you guys so much for listening along. I know it was a bit of a bumpy ride, and I, I tried to make this accessible. <laughs> and I even skipped or elided or simplified some technical parts. But I hope you get the general gist. A lot of people try to argue that, hey, the past can't be infinite, or there can't be infinite causal chains, because if there could be, well, then you could have these Benedetti paradoxes, like the Grim Reaper paradox. But as I argue in this paper, that, that is a very precarious argument, because it's probably going to lead to the impossibility of endless future. After all, we can equally reason that if the future could be endless, then there could be a future-oriented Benedetti paradox. And since there can't be such a paradox, it follows that the future cannot be endless. Anyway, you can find links to this paper and other papers of mine on Benedetti paradoxes, finitism, etc. in the description. You can also find a link to my Kalam playlist in the description, and definitely check out the videos in my Kalam playlist for much more on all these topics and all things Kalam. As always, if you like this video, smash that like button, subscribe, turn on that little bell for notifications, Please consider supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation. Think of that like a tip. I can take off my hat and put it out to you guys at the end of a performance. So if you enjoyed this free labor that I'm doing, thank you so much for even considering making such a donation. And of course, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmid. This is the Majesty of Reason. And peace out.